Good afternoon. My name is Sylvia Barak Fishman, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to a Zoom webinar, part of the EyesGap seminar series on historical tropes in contemporary anti-Semitism. This seminar series brings out the perennial patterns in the phenomenon of anti-Semitism to shed light on why exactly it is the longest hatred. The aims of the series are first to elucidate the millennial themes and variations on these themes that bring out the essence of anti-Semitism. Second, to expose exactly why it is both ancient and modern. Third, to import a deeper understanding of how and why what was once the scandal of anti-Semitism has today morphed into a fashionable idea. And fourth, to enable participants in this seminar to recognize the phenomenon in all its subtle manifestations. Our speaker this afternoon is Professor Miriam Elman. Professor Elman is Executive Director of the Academic Engagement Network an Associate Professor of Political Science at Syracuse University, an award-winning scholar and teacher. Professor Elman has edited and co-edited six books and many, many special issues of academic journals, including Israel Studies. She is the author of over 65 journal articles and book chapters on topics related to contemporary anti-Semitism, peace and conflict resolution, and politics in Israel and the Middle East. For the past several years, Dr. Elman has been serving as the executive director of AEN, which seeks to educate and empower faculty at American universities to speak out against anti-Semitism and virulent anti-Israel propaganda. While at AEM, she has been writing and speaking extensively about the challenges that Israel, pro-Israel and Jewish students face. One of her longstanding research interests is Jewish anti-Semitism, a research interest that I share. Her talk today is entitled, How Jewish Voice for Peace, JVP, Gives Cover to the Anti-Zionist Movements in the United States. We will have plenty of time for Q&A when Dr. Elman finishes her formal remarks. So please feel free to send your questions via the chat function um, on your Zoom screen. And now on behalf of ISGAP, it's my pleasure to present Dr. Miriam Elman. And can you see the screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Well, um, just sorry to interrupt, just to change the display settings and we'll be oh, good yes. to go. And how is that? Perfect. Great. Well, it is really an honor and a delight to be here this afternoon or this evening or this morning, depending on your time zone. And I really want to thank uh, ISCAP for the invitation to present. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be included among the expert speakers that you've lined up for this fall's uh, symposium. And I really want to thank El Shaday for facilitating, facilitating, organizing the program, and to all of you who are participating, dialing in from the United States and from Europe and from Israel. And as always, it's a pleasure to see you again, uh, Sylvia, and thank you so much for moderating today's program. So what I was asked to do was address one slice of a complex issue, the role that the organization Jewish Voice for Peace plays in the US-based anti-Israel movement. Let me just start with the typical disclaimer that the views I will present today are my own. Um, I'm not speaking as a representative of Syracuse University or of the Academic Engagement Network. As a self-identified Jewish wing of the Palestinian Solidarity Movement in the United States, 
Jewish Voice for Peace, or JVP for short, is the most prominent anti-Zionist Jewish group in America today. I've been writing for some years on the anti-Zion, anti-Zionist anti-Semitism, and JVP has become uh, one of its leading purveyors. Um, and I will be drawing on a number of articles and book chapters uh, that I've written recently and are published. Um, many of you may be aware of Jewish Voice for Peace. Maybe you've seen this group operate in your community or on your campus. The most important role that JVP plays is to provide cover and legitimacy as Jews for non-Jewish coalition partners and campaigns. And so for a long time, JVP has served as a sort of alibi for anti-Semites on the left. That is, non-Jews recruit JVP and push it to the forefront of the anti-Israel campaign as a way to deflect accusations of anti-Semitism. And that's been a long-standing practice of the anti-Israel movement, and it's key to understanding JVP's meteoric rise in recent years. Um, let me just you know, mention a few caveats. Um, in this talk, I'm not issuing an indictment of the left or the progressive left, and I'm not trying to disparage individuals who may join JVP as members. I'm not also trying to minimize anti-Semitism on the right. Um, the left, the progressive far left, is not inherently anti-Semitic, and there are many decent people without malice in their hearts for Jews who gravitate to JVP. What I want to do is analyze JVP as an organization and the role that it plays in a social movement. White supremacist groups and a growing normalization of anti-Semitism on the right in its nativist and neo-isolationist pockets and the conspiracisms that are part of that pose serious dangers to American Jewry. My talk today should not be seen in any way as minimizing those concerns that said, far-right anti-Semitism is not being mainstreamed or normalized. There are few white supremacist faculty teaching at US colleges and universities, but as we know all too well, there are plenty of anti-Zionists. So JVP was founded in the 1990s by a small group of California Bay Area Jews, and, and it worked in relative obscurity for years. Uh, the group is notoriously non-transparent about its funding sources. Its website carries no information about its donors. But we do know that it receives financial support from a wide array of private foundations, charitable trusts, many of which also fund other vehemently anti-Israel groups. Among JVP's main benefactors is the Rockefeller Brothers Fund. It also receives funding in the 25 to 50K range from a number of US-based philanthropies. Now, it's really interesting to look at the funding stream here um, because one of JVP's donors in the under 25K category, under 25,000, is the Hope and Justice Educational Foundation. And this is a California-based charity. It reportedly gave just over $1,000 to JVP in 2014, it also contributed that same year $4,000 to If Americans Knew. Now, If Americans Knew is run by Allison Weir, who is a notorious anti-Jewish conspiracy theorist, whose criticism of Israel over the last 15 years so consistently crosses the line into crack pottery that the ADL has a 10-page comprehensive report on her work. So this foundation, Hope and Justice Educational Foundation, is run by Hassan Fouda, who serves on the board of the Council for the National Interest, where Allison Weir is president. And Fouda also apparently supports Sheikh Raid Saleh, the convicted firebrand leader of the northern branch of the Islamic movement in Israel, which Israel outlawed on account of its ties to Hamas. So here's a photo of Fouda with Saleh, and another one on the right of him pretending to be a Jew at a JVP sponsored rally. I believe that when you're evaluating an organization, it's important to consider who donates to it and from whom the group accepts funding. In the early 2000s, JVP reported an approximately, approximate average of 300,000 in annual 
contributions. By 2013, that figure had jumped to over $1 million annually. JVP reported total revenue of 1.4 million in 2014 and 3.7 million in 2017. And I'm the executive director of a nonprofit and $1.4 million jumping to 3.7 million in just three years is not really shabby. Um, so JVP's influence comes primarily from non-Jews who support it because JVP gives them cover. By being a self-declared Jewish group, JVP provides the anti-Israel movement with a veneer of legitimacy. On campus every semester, there are examples of JVP chapters that step up to play this role. Many of you probably heard of this young lady, a Jewish undergraduate student named Rose Rich at the University of Southern California. And last year, she was deliberately targeted, bullied into resigning from her student government post, accused of identifying as a Zionist. She was subjected to weeks long social media campaign by her fellow students who wanted to quote, get her Zionist ass. And she eventually resigned her, her government position, student government for her mental sanity. There was wall to wall condemnation of what happened to Rose Rich with statements issued from many American Jewish organizations. But Jewish Voice for Peace was an outlier. Yes. It jumped Give up to defend Rose Rich uh, that's uh, what's and to defend her harassers. JVP's LA chapter joined with National Students for Justice in Palestine, American Muslims for Palestine, CARE LA, and the US Academic and Cultural Boycott of Israel, US ACPI, to declare that what happened to Rich was not anti-Semitism and that Zionism is by definition fundamentally racist akin to white nationalism. Actual anti-Semitism, they wrote, is not what happened to, Re to Rose Rich. And then they claim to be fierce opponents of anti-Semitism, but they use the letter as an opportunity to slam the Anti-Defamation League and insisted that U USC President Folt drop the ADL from its university anti-Semitism awareness programming. So for JVP, Zionism is akin to white nationalism. And you can see that view expressed time and again by JVP. It's for example, represented in this poster this summer from a recent event in San Diego. Now this was an off-campus event, but JVP co-sponsored it with local Students for Justice in Palestine chapter at San Diego State University. All the other co-hosts are non-Jewish organizations, and JVP is there to help legitimize this rhetoric and activism. JVP works on the American campus to discredit concerns about anti-Semitism, casting them instead, instead as a deceitful effort to censor legitimate discourse and debate about Israel. And this is the same exact role that JVP plays off campus. Consider what happened in Chicago when JVP rushed in to excuse the bigotry of the city's Dyke March activists who forced a group of queer Jews out of its parade. They were carrying rainbow pride flags adorned with the Jewish Star of David. When there was an outcry about their ostracism, JVP stepped up to shield its Dyke March allies from these charges of anti-Semitism. A lesser known example is from St. Louis. JVP took the side of a local Black Lives Matter group in St. Louis, which slandered a popular progressive rabbi there because she had once visited Israel on an APAC sponsored trip. It was a weeks long smear campaign fielded by a local Black Lives Matter group, but the local JVP group was there to provide the Jewish cover. And I ended up writing a blog about it. This is now from 2015, so it's some time ago, but you can see that this is a pattern for Jewish Voice for Peace. The local JVP chapter was not there standing to defend Rabbi Talve, but they stood to defend those who were harassing her. It's important to realize that JVP routinely engages in anti-Semitic forms of anti-Israel expression. Now, what, what does that mean? Um, and the way I see it, anti-Semitism on the left manifests 
as self-defining anti-racists, often from minority communities themselves, expressing a rigidly dogmatic anti-Israelism. Like anti-Semitism on the right, it puts Jews at the center of what's wrong with society, with the state, and with the world. In this worldview, Zionism is not a liberation movement for a persecuted people, but a manifestation of everything that the left has to oppose. And as many of you know, American Jews have long played a role in promoting this anti-Zionism on the radical left. And I would refer you to historian Stephen Norwood at the University of Oklahoma, who has written extensively on left-wing anti-Semitism in the United States, how it manifested in the American Communist Party, in the New Left, and the Black Nationalist Movement in the 60s and 70s. And in these cases, Norwood shows that anti-Semitism was expressed as intense irrational hatred to Israel and Zionism. Norwood explains, quote, after the Six Day War, 1967, Israel became the new Third Reich and Jews the new Nazis. Holocaust inversion was a new way of demonizing Jews by equating the Jewish state with the most genocidal society ever to exist. I thought about Norwood's remark about Holocaust inversion when I saw SJP's re recent Instagram post equating Palestinian terrorists who had escaped from an Israeli jail to Jewish victims who managed to escape a Nazi death camp. Now, JVP's brand of anti-Zionism has a definite Marxian flavor, a formulation that views Jewish nationalism as right-wing, as imperialist, and also as capitalist. JVP's roots are really in the democratic society of the 1960s, which was very much anti-Zionist, and in the Socialist Workers' Party, which also took an official anti-Zionist position all the way back in the 60s. And I think that really helps to explain how today Jewish Voice for Peace leaders and activists can promote and sit alongside the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the PFLP. Because the PFLP, which as you know, is a US designated terror organization, is a secular neo-Marxist group um, that also seeks freedom from global imperialism along with demonizing Israel. Okay, so that really explains this, um, this attraction that JVP has to the PFLP. Now, many of you are probably aware that professors at San Francisco State University have repeatedly tried to bring PFLP terrorist Leila Khalid to speak via Zoom in their open classrooms, events that were ultimately shut down by Zoom as a violation of Zoom's term of use. Now, in all the focus on, on Leila Khalid, few people realize that this was actually a panel event in which Laura Whitehorn of JVP, and you can see her image in the small photo, of, of, the, of the promotional flyer for the event, you know, she was also scheduled to speak alongside um, uh, the sitting member of the PFLP leadership, Leila Khalid. And after social media platforms refused to host the event, JVP fielded a petition claiming that professors and their departments were under attack from quote, ultra right wing Zionists for hosting a conversation with a Palestinian freedom fighter, Leila Khalid. Last year, JVP shared a solidarity poster on its Facebook page, now deleted, and in a now deleted tweet, which commemorated Palestinian and Jewish resistance to oppression. And here JVP cheapened the lives of 280 Israeli civilians who were killed during the first Intifada. It also once again drew a direct comparison between terrorists like Leila Khalid and Jewish partisans during the Holocaust. On and off campus, JVP leaders and activists repeatedly situate themselves as victims of baseless charges of anti-Semitism, seeing themselves as accused and targeted in order to suppress the conversation about Palestinian rights. In this vein, JVP's book on anti-Semitism, you can actually order it from Haymarket Books. Um, and this book includes no authors who actually have expertise on anti-Semitism. Instead, the book aims to give voice to those who are, quote, marginalized by false allegations of bias. So it has authors like Linda Sarsour 
and Omar Barghouti, who founded uh, BDS in the West Bank. Rather than trying to understand contemporary anti-Semitism, this book's contributors are concerned with what they see as the fraudulent use of anti-Semitism to shut down pro-Palestinian voices. It's what they call the weaponization of anti-Semitism, and it's what you see in many, many JVP writings and speeches, this term, the weaponization of anti-Semitism. Now, nowhere do the authors actually provide any evidence of the censorship or repression of pro-Palestinian voices. And as many of you know on the call, uh, it's, it's actually the opposite, which is the case, that is attempts to challenge the received wisdom regarding Zionism, Zionism's wickedness or Israel's malevolence are the ones who are being silenced, smeared, and deplatformed. So it's actually the exact opposite. But JVP's book is a ploy meant to discredit those who take anti-Semitism seriously, who raise the charge and who speak out about it. UK scholar David Hirsch calls this maneuver the Livingstone formulation, where those who complain about anti-Semitism are the ones who are ultimately denounced as being the bigots, instead of those who are actually engaging in the anti-Semitism themselves. There is so much rank anti-Semitism, conspiracy thinking about all powerful Zionist lobbies and likening Israel to Nazi Germany that appears in this JVP book that it's not just embarrassing, it's actually outrageous. And it's important to understand that JVP sees anti-Semitism as emanating only from the right, but it also tends to dismiss Muslim anti-Semitism as inconsequential. For example, at an event at the New School a couple years ago, JVP's Lino Morales asserted that the Nation of Islam's Louis Farrakhan, quote, does not put Jews in danger. Morales further downplayed Farrakhan's anti-Semitism by suggesting that bigotry against Jews expressed by minorities, themselves suffering from structural repressions, should be discounted by, quote, white Jews. Now, I don't have the time in, in roughly 10 more minutes to cover all of JVP's activism, which I describe in, in the book chapters I, I've published and in, and in articles, but I'll just highlight a few examples of the work that it does. Uh, before the group, if not now's well-financed war on birthright, there was JVP's campaign to get Jewish students from going to explore their Jewish identity and heritage. And it's really important to understand that this effort to undermine birthright isn't an opposition to certain Israeli policies that one can legitimately disagree with. It's opposition to the very idea of young American Jews developing a connection to Israel, to Jewish heritage, and to Jewish peoplehood. So JVP stands opposed to the flourishing of Jewish identity. And in my mind, that is also an expression of anti-Semitism. On campuses, we should consider how JVP is spearheading campaigns that exclude, marginalize, and work to ostracize Jewish Zionist students from university life. You can consider uh, these examples, a JVP chapter at Portland State that sold t-shirts with this kind of inflammatory messaging during an event featuring actually anti-Israel academic Norman Finkelstein. But you have to go one further than Norman Finkelstein and, and uh, sell these t-shirts. Um, and last year at George Washington University, JVP issued this statement, Zionism is inherently violent, racist, and should not be allowed in leftist progressive spaces. And that is a central leitmotif in JVP's work. Uh, that Zionism has no place in America's progressive movement. From there, it's only a hop, skip, and a jump to the claim that Zionism needs to be excised from Judaism, that Judaism needs to be reclaimed from Zionism, uh, as in this JVP edited book. Off-campus, JVP has promoted an anti-Israel agenda in America's Protestant churches for well over a decade. Um, this has largely gone under the radar screen of major Jewish organizations, uh, but I, I've written a bit about it and, and others have as well. For example, um, uh, my colleague Dexter Van Zyl at Camera has, has written extensively on JVP and the churches. 
and the role that they play. And, and, and basically, JVP there is, is this ally for anti-Israel activity. And here, too, the goal is to excuse, provide excuses, deflect charges of anti-Semitism, but also to assure the mainline churches that Jewish-Christian relationships will not be jeopardized by standing against Israel because it's something all Jews committed to social justice want. That, that's why they're there. Um, JVP activists also exploit Jewish culture and traditions, celebrations, and life cycle events. Um, JVP does this to reinforce that its anti-Israelism is not merely consistent with Jewish values, but is based on Jewish values. And this is a, a large chunk of JVP's US-based programming. Uh, JVP usurps Jewish religious holidays, continually incorporating virulently anti-Israel themes into them, anti-Zionist themes into them. It's, it's in a way a theft of Jewish heritage and it's particularly visible during Passover with its annual released Haggadahs that, that JVP promotes. Um, and, and it's really fascinating to look at these Haggadahs and the way the Jewish text is is twisted by dedicating the third cup of wine to the BDS movement, a section on the 10 plagues of the Israeli occupation. Uh, users are invited to conclude the Seder next year in Al-Quds. And I think that this can really be usefully compared to the Soviet campaign to do away with Passover by infusing the holiday with communist propaganda. At Passover, Jews were encouraged to rewrite the Haggadah with pro-communist and anti-capitalist passages, hold Sovietized Passover seders, and perform elaborate anti-Jewish street theater during the holiday. Recognizing the powerful hold that religion had on Soviet Jews, the Jewish section of the Communist Party, the Yevsexia, attempted to capture and transform Jewish traditions and texts, including the Passover Haggadah, and these were called the Red Haggadahs, with the explicit goal of replacing belief in God with the faith in the Soviet Union. At the Seder's conclusion, Jews were famously uh, encouraged to proclaim, this year we are here, uh, next year we will have a world revolution. Um, and I think this kind of Soviet propaganda bears an eerie resemblance to the kind of identity theft of Jewish heritage that is central to JVP's war on Passover, to be honest, it looks a lot the same. Let me conclude uh, in just a few minutes by flagging JVP's deadly exchange, arguably the most vicious campaign launched by the anti-Israel movement to date. Five years ago, JVP rolled out this new campaign, alleging that some of the leading organizations of American Jewish life, the Anti-Defamation League, American Jewish Committee were deliberately conspiring to harm American people of color by organizing and funding counter-terror training programs between the U.S. and Israeli law enforcement. Now, I've looked at these training programs. I've read dozens of testimonials by high-ranking U.S. police officers who have participated in them, and none of them describe tactical training with the IDF in coercive techniques. Uh, the trainings uh, involve law enforcement, learning with their counterparts how to combat hate crime, how to maintain a state of readiness of all kinds of threats, mass shootings to terror attacks. They learn about community policing, how to successfully recruit for minority communities. Um, and there's simply not a shred of evidence that American street cops on the beat received hands-on tactical training in Israel, which makes them more prone to shoot people of color in the United States. No one has tied a single American police officer involved in a questionable shooting to the ADL or AJC 10-day counter-terror seminars uh, by them or by any other Jewish American organization. And I have been keeping a close eye on this campaign since it was rolled out in 2017. I've written about a half dozen articles on it. I viewed all the materials uh, online, the videos, research reports that have been produced. What I have concluded is that deadly exchange is simply a shoddy research design. It would never pass muster if a graduate student were to present this uh, as a dissertation topic. 
Um, but it has really had legs in the anti-Israel movement. It mistakes correlation for causation. It manipulates evidence. It fabricates evidence. Um, but it is important to understand the accusation here because what Deadly Exchange is doing is not only conceiving Israel as being, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a malevolent uh, uh, player in the Middle East. It's, it's also conceiving Israel as part of a wider Jewish conspiracy. And it alleges that mainstay American Jewish organizations are co-conspirators with Israel in some nefarious mission to oppress their fellow citizens, particularly people of color and immigrant groups. So it's the ADL and the other American Jewish groups that are connecting Israel to a militarized American police and it's American Jews who are thus being scapegoated and being held responsible for police abuses. Basically, this campaign views American Jewish organization as a hidden and moneyed force behind the degradation of societies and the manipulation of governments, a claim straight out of the infamous anti-Semitic forgery, the protocols of the elders of Zion. Now deadly exchange has begun to move from off-campus arenas, municipalities, city councils to campus spaces. At UC Berkeley a couple of years ago at a student government meeting, we heard this, where one student stood up and said, the IDF trains American police to kill black people. There are full blown deadly exchange campaigns today underway on a number of campuses. And in the wake of George Floyd's killing, we started seeing the campaign material pop up in events across the country. What's interesting about this year's events is that it's Students for Justice in Palestine chapters that are hosting them, often without any JVP co-sponsorship. And it's important to be clear about what that means, that JVP is now no longer merely condoning or excusing anti-Semitism from its allies and coalition partners. It's now in the business of producing anti-Semitism for its allies. So when you hear Linda Sarsour or Temple University's Mark Lamont Hill, or care leaders in Georgia uh, promoting deadly exchange, they are now consumers of an anti-Semitic campaign that was the brainchild of JVP. And there's another worrisome aspect to all of this because white supremacy groups and networks are promoting and sharing deadly exchange campaign materials. Uh, the UK's CSD is, has, has done a, uh, a report on this. And so here we see unhinged vitriolic hostility to Israel from both extremes of the political spectrum, and they are virtually indistinguishable. As another example to this, I recently found out that the San Antonio JVP chapter ended up being at the same anti-Israel protest as a group of neo-Nazis a week ago. Both JVP and these white supremacists had come to protest an annual fundraiser for Israel held by the pro-Zionist Cornerstone Church. This was on uh, Sunday, October 24th. So here are these two separate protesters. They did not coordinate, but they were both there, the neo-Nazis and JVP. And blogger David Lang of Israeli Cool uh, blogged about it, uh, broke the story and had this to say, quote, if you find yourself protesting the same thing as a bunch of neo-Nazis, you may just be on the wrong side of the issue. To conclude, in the past, JVP's main utility for the anti-Israel movement was to shield its non-Jewish allies from accusations of anti-Semitism. JVP still plays that role, and I would argue it's the main role that it still plays. But in the last few years, it's begun trafficking itself in longstanding tropes and canards that have sustained fear and loathing of Jews across the millennia. This, in my mind, makes Jewish Voice for Peace different from other leftist supporters of the Palestinians who oppose the occupation or Israel's settlement policies. I believe that sometimes we can be too quick to call our critics anti-Semites. But in the case of the organization Jewish Voice for Peace, I believe the label is accurate. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Elman. That was an amazing 
presentation, which aroused all kinds of interests and, um, and questions and um, a lot of interest in seeing the, this uh, presentation again. So um, Daphne, Daphne Clayman from ISCAP has already assured everyone that it will be on YouTube starting tonight. So this, this presentation will be available for people both who want to review it and for those who weren't able to see it now. Um, and we have a lot of very, very interesting uh, questions. Um, I wonder if you could start with one of the um, more less complicated questions, I think, which is how do we know that the participants in JVP are actually Jewish? Um, what does the research show us about who these folks really are? That is a, a very, very good question. It's Joseph um, Evans' question. <laughs> it's a very good question. Um, we do know that the leadership uh, that is put forward and, um, for example, the outspoken leaders that serve on the rabbinic academic council, uh, those in the, the executive directorship position, associate director position, those that have their names up on the website, um, self-define as Jewish and, and are very likely halakhically Jewish. Um, however, the roster of members that join are all over the place in terms of uh, whether they self-define as Jewish or whether they are halakhically Jewish. Um, there have been a lot of um, findings of this for example, a JVP chapter in Lebanon that was created and you know, did not have um, Jewish members in it uh, and other sort of lower down the chain leadership um, that does not seem to be uh, Jewish. Um, the other part, and, and I know there's a question I think in the chat about funding, um, our colleague, many of us uh, on this call uh, know uh, Gerald Steinberg at Bar Ilan University and his NGO monitor group. He's done a couple of um, reports uh, over the years of JVP's funding stream, um, cameras, um, uh, 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 um, uh, scholars and researchers have also done, um, um, scholar Hollander, Ricky Hollander has done, some um, pieces on JVP's funding as well. Um, and we know that a lot of that funding is not Jewish money. So they may be, most of them, more or less Jewish. And uh, here in I- In the would, leadership, in the leadership. Leadership. And here I would say that the classic sociology way of looking at who is a Jew is if you call yourself you're a Jew, you're a Jew. So um, in, in that sense, if these people are claiming Jewishness, um, any study would probably consider them to be Jews, or most studies would probably consider them. Right, like, like Hassan Fuda in my slide holding up the sign, uh, Jews against, against. But on the other hand. Jewish, uh, pretending to be Jewish at Jewish Voice for Peace events is, is, is quite common as well. Um, but um, you give us the wonderful principle of follow the money and um, the money in fact supporting them is not Jewish, which I think says a lot. Um, now um, we have a question, JVP giving cover to anti-Semites as a Jewish organization is what you've been talking about, but what can viewers do about the fact that some prominent Jewish scholars um, kind of give JVP a, um, a kashrut um, uh, diploma um, by including them as legitimate organizations. Is there, is there a, any way to combat that phenomenon? Well, I can, I can share with you that um, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a, a campus in the University of California system uh, where there was a, an, a longstanding um, ADL, anti-Semitism awareness training um, that had been, you know, been going on for some years there. And um, that year, a couple, couple years ago, there was a group of faculty at this UC, UC uh, campus 
who said, it, no, it should not be ADL doing it. It should be JVP doing it because they've got this great book on anti-Semitism and they, they can, they're the experts. And, and, and in fact, we can do it because we are faculty here. Um, and, 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 and so we in AEN and, and, and some other organizations wrote to the president and said, you know, JVP is not serious on anti-Semitism. You should stick with the ADL. And in fact, they did do that. Um, but this is a really good point being made um, uh, by the audience member because um, it really showcases the way in which um, a, a faculty member, particularly let's say the faculty member is a senior scholar in Jewish studies, um, that person will be the go-to address for administrators. They want to understand an incident that happened on campus. Was it anti-Semitism? Jewish students are upset. They'll go to that you know, director of Jewish studies or, or senior named chair in Jewish studies. And if that you know, faculty member is um, uh, a card-carrying member of JVP or very quite sympathetic, to JVP, you can imagine that the incident will be downplayed, right? Uh, don't worry about it. That's, you know, it's not any, you know, it's, it's just trying to silence uh, free speech or silence Palestinian voices, right? So it will be minimized uh, if it's anti-Semitism on the left. And we do see that on a few campuses where there are um, uh, high placed uh, JVP sympathetic um, scholars. Now, JVP does have a, an academic group. Uh, it's a small group of, um, of academics that promote the JVP mission, and they go around and give talks and, and speeches. But by and large, um, JVP is, is, is an off-campus phenomena that comes onto campus through its prominent campaigns. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and Students for Justice in Palestine or other uh, more prominent uh, 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 student organizations and, and, and faculty affiliated with those organizations will use JVP when they need cover. So, you know, they'll, they'll put them on. Um, JVP doesn't have nearly as many campus chapters as, as SJP does. Um, but in campuses where there's been some tension over SJP, suddenly you see a JVP pop up as a way to um, provide that legitimacy, that veneer of legitimacy for a Students for Justice in Palestine um, a campaign, let's say. Um, I still think that, you know, JVP originated off campus. It still largely operates off campus, um, but it will come on uh, through invitation. So um, one, of, one of the questions was about the development of JVP, the evolution of JVP. Were they initially less virulently anti-Israel? Were they what they are now from the beginning? And when did they cease to be obscure? How did that happen? It's a great, it's a great story and why I've been interested in this group as as a political scientist, it's a story about institutions. It's a story about how institutions grow and thrive and often how they, how they hijack uh, other spaces uh, like in the churches, uh, for example. Um, so, so it, you know, I, I, I think there has been an evolution. And then when you look at, at um, JVP in the 1990s, it was quite ambivalent about Zionism in that period. Um, uh, moving all the way into the 2000s, um, but I think it was pushed to be, to, to really take a declarative stance um, uh, and, 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 and um, um, be very open and public about being anti-Zionist and then taking this radical turn towards, I think, the anti-Semitic uh, uh, kinds of anti-Israel expression that we see. We did not see that in its earlier iterations of JVP in the Bay Area, where it was very much, um, uh, certainly, you know, very much on the left and anti-occupation, and 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 and, but 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 not really staking out these claims against American Jewish establishment, trying to undermine ADL and AJC, uh, you know, making these conspiracy claims or getting into the business of of Israel and, 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 and white supremacy. Um, that, that's all a very new turn. 
Um, I think some of what JVP does is, um, is instrumental. I think it's where, how they get their money. Um, and it's a way to show donors, you want us there, this is what we're doing and we're being successful at it. Um, and uh, so, so it is a bit self-serving. Um, I did a few posts a while back about JVP's rupture with Allison Weir's, if not, uh, if Americans knew. And, and there is official break with Allison Weir, not at the chapter level though, at the chapter level, JVP still promotes uh, Allison Weir, certain chapters around the country. But at the leadership level, there was a break. And it wasn't because of Weir's um, uh, 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 anti-Semitic, anti-Zionism, or per se her, her, her anti-Semitism. It was because being associated with Weir was giving JVP a bad look since Weir had become so pro-white in, 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 the, in, the, in the discourse and was seen as, so it was seen as a liability in order to create these connections with um, uh, progressive groups of color. So very instrumental, very self-serving, uh, and, and I think that's also a key to understanding the progression. Um, the leadership is very savvy in what they do, what they choose to do, how they promote their work, when they back off a little bit and when they push forward. Um, and that's a key to understanding this organization's success. Um, I see Avi Gold here. Avi, if you can unmute yourself, please. And you has a, he has a very interesting question of comparing um, the materials that you've talked about with Muslim anti-Zionist activists. Avi. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? I cannot hear, Avi. Yes, the microphone is not so great. Um, so, uh, Do you want me to ask your question, Avi, if it's hard to hear? Okay, sure. Are there any studies comparing the tactics of JVP and the tactics of groups such as NKUSA. I've noticed that Muslim anti-Zionist activists tend to make much more use of the latter than the former as a cover. Um, I, I think that's a very interesting question. It's, um, uh, I, I like the idea of comparing across organizations and kind of just in general thinking about the similarity of tactics, I think they 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 actually mimic each other uh, and adopt you know what works and what doesn't work. Um, so I do like that. I you know we find with JVP constant um, allyship <clears throat> with um, non-Jewish uh, uh, organizations, um, you know, including American Muslims for Palestine, Students for Justice in Palestine. Uh, U.S. campaign for Palestinian rights, uh, uh, you know, all of which are promoting a very radical uh, uh, Islamist position, um, and so it's this, it's this, it's this strange bedfellows that people talk about um, the Red Green Alliance, right? And and here I think we really need to to to, to look at the way JVP gives that cover um, because they all. You know, and this is key why JVP has exponentially risen in its funding, right? Is because people realize the service that it uses. It can't go away. Nothing else can really, really if, if JVP didn't exist, you'd have to create it, right? In order to provide that, that veneer of legitimacy, in order to what I call Jew wash <clears throat> the anti Semitism away from the non Jews, right? So, um, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, what I find really interesting is the way in which JVP is now producing some of that material. So up till now, you could really talk about JVP solely serving this role <clears throat> as being brought in to provide cover to campaigns that others produced, right? And, and, and sort of JVP was there um, uh, to provide the veneer of legitimacy to anti-Semitic forms of anti-Israel expression. Um, but since 2015, and that's now going on seven years, um, I think JVP is producing a lot of the material that others are using. And, and, th and then they actually drift away and let others go with it. So 
Deadly Exchange has become the number one campaign in the anti-Israel BDS movement, uh, certainly off campus, but more so on campus too, post George Floyd. It's something every single organization has adopted as their uh, central um, uh, campaign. And, uh, and, and JVP isn't even you know, there in the messaging anymore. Um, so I, I think that's um, a, a shift in their role and what they're doing in the leadership. Uh, and, um, and so I think someone talked about JVP's role with regard to IRA versus the JDA. And you can see now JVP taking these initiatives that others are not taking, doing it on their own and then others supporting what JVP is doing. Um, so JVP on campus is very active in the anti um, uh, IRA definition and trying to promote other definitions and castigating people who support IRA and so forth. And that, that's very much a, a JVP initiated campaign. So that's a long winded um, answer to, I think we need to do more of that comparison uh, and, and kind of figuring out the, the similarities and the differences across tactics. So speaking of comparisons, um, Deadly Exchange um, claims that Jews persecute persons of color um, and make their lives more difficult. We have the opposite or seemingly the opposite accusation um, that Jews purposely bring immigrants of color into the United States. This is from the right wing. Purposely bring immigrants and are responsible for the influx of immigrants to make life more difficult for white people in the United States. That's an example of where the left and the right seem to be accusing Jews of the exact opposite thing. But I wonder if you could comment on, are there areas where left-wing anti-Semitism and right-wing anti-Semitism overlap and are more similar? So um, I love this example because I think it fits with my caveat at the start of my talk that nothing I'm saying uh, is to excuse or to minimize uh, the threat to American Jewry posed by um, uh, the, the, the far right, uh, and particularly um, uh, the uh, conspiracisms about uh, uh, Jews controlling US immigration policy and the manifestations of that in violence as we've seen uh, recently. Um, so uh, what's interesting to me about Deadly Exchange and comparing it to um, uh, Jews uh, destroying white man's America is that it's centrally the same kind of thing, right? Where Jews play the central role in, in the story of the degradation of American society, right? It's just that the left and the right are looking at different uh, processes there, um, and 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 but the Jew is the central variable for both, right? Um, and 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 so in that sense, there's the the recreation of the same tropes and canards about Jewish power and Jewish money that are playing in in for both. Um, uh, uh, so you know, I think I think it's it's actually worth um, um, showing that, and when you do show that, sometimes there is an aha moment for people, uh, and I've seen that when I've described Deadly Exchange and uh, showcased exactly what it does. Um, I think in the end, it makes people suspicious about their Jewish neighbors. And that's the same thing that we find on the right, far right, as we find on, on, on the far left. Um, so um, I, I actually don't, don't see this, this, this huge difference. I think anti-Semitism is anti-Semitism. We can find it across the political spectrum. And it looks very similar in terms of dehumanizing Jews, demonizing Jews, and making them the central, uh, the central part of the story, right? The central figures, the central players. Okay, that's a, a great principle to look for when we're trying to define something as anti-Semitism. Yes. And speaking of definitions of anti-Semitism, you spoke a little bit about um, JVP and the um, IRHA definition of anti-Semitism. How about the Jerusalem Declaration of Anti-Semitism? We have a question 
Are you aware if the Jerusalem Declaration and anti-Semitism supporters, do they have any connection to JVP that you know of? So JVP doesn't like the Jerusalem Declaration either. Uh, doesn't think it goes far enough in, in creating a, a tolerable anti-Zionism. And J JVP wants to excise Zionism from Judaism, creating a completely new religion. That, that, that is the ultimate goal um, in a lot of its work and a lot of its programming. It's, it's, it's a full and complete demonization of, of, of Zionism uh, and Zionism as anti-Semitism, in fact. I don't think that's the purpose of, of the, the Jerusalem Declaration, the Van Leer Institute Declaration of Anti-Semitism. Um, so JVP, uh, in, its, in its campaign against IRA, it's sort of stuck with, with uh, opposition to IRA rather than the promotion of, of JDA, which it thinks is too tepid in its anti-Zionism. Um, I think the JDA wants to create a tolerable, a tolerable anti-Zionism, one that can be defined as not anti-Semitic, but, but the JDA also recognizes, like Ira does, that there is some points that we can identify given all the context and the circumstances that this does cross the line. This anti-Israel, anti-Zion expression does cross the line. JVP doesn't see that at all. There is no crossing the line. Anti-Semitism is only on the right. Um, and anything that targets the left is an attempt to silence legitimate, um, legitimate uh, 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 discourse on, on, on Israel. And, and for, for JVP, um, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a complete support of the BDS um, pers perspective. So anything that JVP does, if it's against IRA, the, the, the next paragraph will be promotion of BDS and the BDS perspective on Zionism. So this will probably be the last question. Um, we have Sarah Rudin, who is a Quaker. Um, and during the 1990s in South Africa, she saw that many of the so-called peace churches were wholly co-opted by Islamic radicals and anti-Israel causes. Um, many of the uh, people on the chat responding to Sarah said that they belong to dialogue groups and they would like to get Quakers and others who believe in peace um, involved um, so that they better understand Israel's situation, more realistically understand Israel's situation. Um, what does your research show you about the best ways to deal with, you had mentioned Protestant groups, um, and we know that there are whole wings of the Protestant movement who have been distinguished by their um, sort of relentless anti-Israel activity. Um, what does is, what is your research show? What is advice that people could take in helping to um, various Protestant and other groups, religious groups to understand Israel's situation? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, uh, and um, uh, what I have found, and I've Again, I find this a, um, a, a, a really interesting story about institutions. Um, the, the groups, uh, the, the denominations um, in the mainline churches where they've gone furthest towards a pro-BDS, virulent anti-Israel um, uh, narrative and messaging and, 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 and even po in the policy has been where there isn't any pushback. So you have... Um, a variety of, uh, of anti-Israel Palestinian groups, uh, groups like Sabil, for example, that has East Jerusalem and West Bank uh, uh, origins, but has chapters in America. And they're at the churches. And so some of these other um, non-Jewish, uh, often Palestinian uh, groups that, that are trying to message out they form a little committee or they form a council or they form, form a, 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 a subcommittee within the church. Uh, and then they'll bring in JVP as a way to promote their cause as being not anti-Jewish and not detrimental to the church's relationships with Jews and so forth. Where there is a pushback to those 
that those subcommittees or those sub church groups, um, like in the Presbyterian church, there's Presbyterians for Middle East peace that have organized a counter push and produced documents and reports for the membership, for the leadership at, 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 at the um, conferences and conventions and so forth. Um, it's harder. It, it's harder for the other groups because there is this pushback um, and it's with, from within the church. It's not coming from the American Jewish Committee or ADL, from you know, um, a non-Christian um, outside. It's, it's actually within the church uh, and, and they can bring in um, authentic Palestinian voices uh, that are not anti-Israel, that, 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 that speak to a variety of ways in which you can advance the Palestinian cause um, and uplift the Palestinian voice. And so it's been very effective in those, in those particular churches. Um, it's also just important to um, uh, expose, to expose the, the, you know, the, the obnoxiousness or the viciousness of the attacks and the way in which it sucks all the oxygen out of other things that need to be done right, the plight of Christians in the Middle East and across, you know, many parts of the country, all, all that is not addressed because there's so much attention devoted to the anti-Israel campaign, right? And so the more you can say there's these other issues um, that need to be addressed, that are important for the church to address, and um, uh, this looks to be like politicizing a cause, we're not trying to shut these people, you know, anybody down, but really, do we need to spend year after year on, 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 on a BDS motion when there's so many other important matters for, for our church to undertake? That, that has also been effective. Um, and lastly, I would say continue, continue the dialogue groups um, because it is important for, um, in these Christian denominations at the local level, you know, wherever you live at your local level, that if it's the United Church of Christ or what, whatever church it is, Methodists, or the, that they know that, um, that the organized Jewish community in, in, in your local area does not support BDS, does not support deadly exchange, does not support, you know, and, and to sit down and really go through a resolution. And we've done that in, in my local community and go through what's just been passed and our objections to it and and because at the end of the day it's it's, it's all local right and, and 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 many of these churches do want um the positive relationships with federation and jcrc and the local jewish community and um and so you know it, it's important that um uh, media local politicians and so forth know that uh jvp they they can platform they can do a protest they can do an event as individuals, I think JVP members should be invited into the big Jewish tent as individuals, uh, but that the local community knows that they're not the address for understanding uh, the mainstream Jewish position, that they're a fringe group, that they're identified as that by the ADL and by others, um, and that uh, they should not be the go-to address uh, for all things Jewish. Um, and that, that, for example, was a problem in Durham, uh, if anybody's on the call from, from, from Durham, um, uh, Chapel Hill, Raleigh area, North Carolina, is that JVP activists uh, for some years um, took over leadership positions in the local Jewish community and became the go-to people for um, understanding uh, various petitions that were being fielded out in the community by non-Jewish groups. Um, and you know, in my community, that would never have happened. Like, that would never have happened from the get-go because media and politics and others would know to come to Federation first. And, you know, but when you have JVP in leadership positions like that, um, you know, that, that pose does pose a problem um, for unifying the Jewish community to oppose a, a campaign like Deadly Exchange. So it sounds like there's prep work that needs to be done. A lot of prep work. For non-anti-Semitic, non-anti-Zionist Jewish organizations to get their name out there and to get their work out there so that when reporters or others are looking for a Jewish address, they don't automatically turn to groups who are going to um, right. speak poison. Very <laughs> Jewish Voice for Peace sounds terrific, yes, right? right? Right, right. 
Thank you so, so much to our speaker, Dr. Miriam Elman. Um, and um, in two weeks, there will be another session in this seminar. And uh, thank you all for coming. It was wonderful to have you all here. I know that there were a lot of questions that we didn't have time to answer. Um, this lecture, and I apologize, this lecture will be available on YouTube tonight. Um, and thank you all for participating.